Thank you. Okay. So, I'm going to speak to you for the next 30 minutes about hacking. And I wanted to start by uh, kind of aligning our expectations uh, on what we mean when we speak about hacking. So, just to be clear, I spent over a decade of my life uh, being a hacker. That's way before I became a scientist. I had a company uh, back in Israel, it still exists. Uh, company that tries to uh, provide security solutions, but it started as a pure hacking company. We were just to be hired by banks, trying to break into their systems and find flaws in their security and help them uh, find better ways to secure themselves. I uh, wrote some of the early, early uh, 2000 uh, bug tracked uh, uh, code that kind of explained how to uh, minimize and exploit in systems that some of you probably don't even know of, called crystal reports. And, uh, Super beta, all kinds of old systems that that, uh, that changed significantly since then. But I wrote a lot of exploits for those systems, and so hacking is something that uh, that I really care about a lot. Uh, I, I was absolved as a hacker, but now I'm a scientist, so uh, I talk to you mostly about uh, the brain. Because what I do right now is I'm a neuroscientist, and I try to apply the same knowledge I used back in the days when we try to look at computers and try to figure out what they do from the outside, looking in, to our brain. Now, when we talk about hacking, uh, there's kind of many ways to interpret the term and what you want to do, and when I think about that, I basically uh, think about uh, two things that you need to have if you want to kind of think about hacking, and that is you have to have a code to understand and some vulnerability in the system. So, step one is to understand what is the code that the brain actually speaks in. So there's many, uh, you know, for every system there's its own code, there's in, in the magnetic fields and in the volts, and that's kind of what known as bits, zeros and one. If you look at the DNA, you can look at the uh, nucleic acids or proteins as a code. What is the code that the brain speaks in? Well, it turns out that if you uh, look inside a brain and you kind of put electrodes and start listening, what you see is that there's cells speaking to each other in an uh, electrochemical a signal that we interpret as spikes, which if you kind of translate the sound, the, the, the spikes, into something that's like a sound, you hear something that sounds kind of like that. There was a little burst of activity that you're going to hear in a second. You don't hear it. So I'm going to try to uh, emulate that. Uh, what you should have heard right now, hopefully the sound's going to come back, a little burst of activity. And that was the burst of activity, they start like trrr, trrr, trrr. Each time you hear this thing, it's one cell speaking to another cell and telling it that it cares about something in the world. So if you could potentially put electrodes in the brain and listen to cells talking to birds like that, you can actually try to correlate that with what happened in the outside world and understand what is the brain thinking about. So this is kind of what I was interested in uh, doing. And uh, not, not just me, a lot of scientists are trying to do that, and they do it in one of two ways. When it comes to animals, we can now open their brain and stick electrodes inside their brain, kind of like what you saw in Adam's talk. You can stick electrodes in their brain and have them listen to the activity and tell, uh, tell you what the uh, mouse in that example, or rat, or cats, or dogs, or monkeys are doing. And when it comes to humans, you cannot put electrodes in their brain, so what we often do is we use imaging techniques. So we look at their brain using something that measures the scalp activity, or sticks the entire brain in a big machine that has magnetic fields run through your brain and try to understand what's going on. And using those, try to understand something about how the little cells inside are processing information. Well, turns out I actually lied to you before because I have been spending the last 10 years doing what I said is impossible to do, which is look inside the brains of humans with electrodes in their head. It's something that you can't do often, but you can do it with patients who undergo brain surgery, and for the purpose of the surgery, they need to have uh, electrodes in their brain to figure out the exact location of the problem. And then what we have is a human being with open brain and electrodes inside. I can skip that to the next one, you don't, don't have to see that. Uh, so what you have is a person who sits in bed, his or her brain are open, and you have electrodes sticking inside their head, trying to record what's going on there for many, many days. And the hope is that while the electrodes are there, you can actually listen in to the activity and figure out what problem they have, and accordingly fix the problem. So this gives us about two weeks of a person sitting in bed, watching TV, listening to music, can't really move a lot because their brain is connected to a machine, but otherwise they just sit there and they wait for whatever problem they have to manifest itself. So now I can come to the patient and say, you know, you're going to be here for the next two weeks. You don't really do a lot. Do you mind also letting me show you movies, ask you questions, talk to you, and use the fact that we have electrodes in your brain to learn something about how you think? The patients are very happy to comply with that, and this allows us to do something that's very unique, which is look at the brains of humans from the inside. Now, when you do that, you 
can actually listen to the activity, and I'm going to show you, for example, what we can get from looking at that. So here's an example. Here's one patient, Spain. This woman is sitting in bed right now and watching a movie, and what you see at the top of the movies that she's watching, what you're going to hear, hopefully it's not going to work, is the sound of one cell in her brain that speaks whenever she cares about something. No sound. Can we try to fix that? So those spikes that you hear, those burst of activity, this is one step in her brain talking. Let's see if we can figure out together what it cares about. What makes this a really burst of activity? Welcome to Wall Street and the New York Stock Exchange, the world's largest and surprisingly one of the have similar cells in your head. Those cells came to life right now when you saw this little cartoon character and you knew what it was. And those cells aren't just coding the visual image of the Simpson, they actually code the thought. If you think about the Simpson right now, just think about it for a second, the same cells fire again and again. And I know that because I came back to the patient afterwards and I said, you know what, in the morning you've seen a lot of movies, now forget about seeing anything. Just sit in bed, close your eyes, and try to recall from your memory the things you've seen in the morning. What you're gonna see now is that when she remembers the Simpson in her own head, we can actually hear the activity of the cell firing. In fact, we can hear the cell firing a few seconds before she speaks. So we can actually see her memory in action. they even get to experience it of themselves. So this is a step towards what we want to do, which is change the brain, but it's not the entire story because we don't want to read. We actually want to change something. We want to manipulate something inside the head. So, so people, it turned out, are not that happy to let you uh, uh, change things in their brain. I found this quote uh, uh, from the Swedish proverb in the, that says that people are uh, more likely to complain about their body than about their brain. And you can know it because people go to the gym all the time to change uh, how their body looks and how healthy they are, but many of them go to therapists who can try to kind of poke in their head and change that. So, so people are not as happy as uh, we think about letting us change their brain, maybe because they think it's invasive, maybe they think that it's not okay to poke in someone's brain, but whatever reason it is, people aren't as happy to let us do those changes, even though I'm convinced that pretty much every little event in our life changes our brain. And I wanted to convince you first on that, so I can show you why changing brain is actually something that you don't need to get your agreement for. We can actually just do it without you being voluntary, having to like, let us do that. So here's an example of that. Here's a, a picture that if you've seen before, your brain's already changed, but if you didn't see it before, it looks like a bunch of stains on a blue, a black and blue, black and white uh, screen. But if you uh, look carefully at this section here, what you're gonna see is there's actually like a black and white picture of a Dalmatian dog. You can kind of uh, highlight that here and see it. And once you identify the dog in this picture, your brain has changed. And that's a change that's gonna be there for the rest of your lives. So I only changed everyone's brain if you didn't know it before, because your brains from now on will always see this dog in this picture, no matter what. Somehow your brain immediately adapted and knows this thing. Let's look at another example for that. Here's another example. Here's a, 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 a little flickering picture here. And I'm telling you right now that your brain already sees something abnormal in this picture and it doesn't know what it is. But what I'm going to tell you is that actually there's two pictures here and they're alternating. They're flickering. And in fact, there's one little thing that changes between those two pictures. And now, you maybe can raise your hand if you see this difference. Now, those of you who raised their hand right away probably know it from before, so that's not that cheating. And if you didn't know it from before, try to look, try to see what is changing. Don't, don't tell me yet, just wanna, because I wanna see. But you can see that there's, maybe it's the window on the plane, maybe it's the little hat here, maybe it's the shadow, maybe a number of soldiers. Something is changing. It's the engine by the center. So if you didn't think before, again, I just changed your brain right away. I made you, I gave more information and this kind of flow in your brain and changed everything. If you feel smart about the first one, here's another one that's going to make anyone feel a little bit dumb. So you can have a chance to also, if you, if you did the first one, try again. Again, raise your hand when you see the change. Okay. Two, three. Okay, we're getting there. I can let you uh, play it for a while, but I'll just tell you that it's this bush here that's changing. 
So all of those uh, are little changes that reduce your brain. And accordingly, if we believe that, then the question is, who is the person who resists the change? And who is the person that absorbs the change? And can we maybe come between those two? Can we somehow come in your brain between the one who wants to change and the one who doesn't want to change and, 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 and do something that kind of uh, works with the one against the other? Now, this is, sounds very tricky. I'm working with part of your brain against another part of your brain. And what does it mean even to have two parts of your brain? Do you really believe that there's more than one person inside your head? So it turns out that scientists have been looking at that for a while and they found that indeed there are more than one person inside your head. And, and, and there's a, a number of people who are kind of sitting there and they vote together on your actions and usually you kind of take the sum of all of those votes and you act on them and you just believe that this was what you wanted all the time. You, you never kind of believe that you actually had other people who maybe were opposition to some action. And one way to demonstrate that was a study that was done in the 60s uh, by uh, uh, Gizaniga in, in, in Caltech at the time where he took people who had a brain problem that required surgery where in the surgery he split their brain in half so he cut the part of the brain that connects the two sides of the brain the left and the right and it turns out that if you uh, cut the brain in half you don't just stop seizures or uh, other brain disorders you also stop the communication between two sides and since parts of the brain uh, control different things, if you stop the communication, sometimes things cannot happen. So in this example, there's a patient who's a split brain guy, and he is trying to solve a puzzle. So he's asked to solve the puzzle with his uh, left hand, and he has no problem. He tries to kind of organize the cubes in a way that makes this uh, shape here in the picture. It takes a few seconds to do it with his left hand, because the left hand speaks to the part of the brain on the right that solves the puzzle. When he's done the same thing with his right hand, he has a problem because the right hand doesn't speak to the part of the brain that solves the puzzle. So he just sits there and he struggles with solving the same problem that his other part of the brain knows how to solve. And you see in a second that the left hand here actually knows the answer, so it wants to help its other friend. And if he's allowed to do it with both hands, you can actually see competition happening outside of his body. So this competition happens in your brain all the time, where there's kind of a fight over the dominance, but here this guy actually demonstrates very vividly this fight between two sides of his body that kind of fight for dominance over who's going to get to solve the puzzle, the one on the left or the one on the right. So this seems like a, uh, an insane event, but actually it happens in your brain all the time, as I said. And now the question is, can we talk to the part that allows us to change things against the part that doesn't want to change anything? Well, the question is first, uh, when you look at the brain, are there kind of uh, uh, numerous parts and, and do you have access yourself to all of those parts? And what it turns out to be the case is that some parts of your brain uh, operate on their own without you being there to kind of govern them. And if you can find them, we can maybe hack the brain, we can actually change them and have the other part of your brain just think that this was a choice that the brain itself made. And just to convince you for a second that indeed, looking inside the brain, we can find people that are not under your control, I wanted to tell you this story that's kind of famous now, the story of Charles Whitman, who was a, a, a guy who became famous in grave circumstances in the 60s, when he took a cab from his house in Austin, Texas, and drove to the University of Austin, climbed the tallest building there, and stood at the top of the building, pulled an AK-47 and started spraying people down below, killing 14 people right away, then he made, waited for about half an hour for the emergency ambulance to show up and he shot the uh, helpers and he altogether injured about a couple of dozens of people and killed a couple of dozens as well before he was shot by the police. When the police tried to investigate what led him to this behavior, they went to his apartment, they went to his friends, everything seemed normal about this guy, they couldn't find any evidence for a specific reason for that until they found a little diary buried under his bed in his house and in his diary he himself reported that he feels that in the last three months his brain is changing. He said, I'm not myself, I have awful thoughts, I'm worried I'm going to do something bad, I think something awful is going to happen, and he writes in his diary that he thinks that his brain is not okay, is not under control, and he says if I end up doing something awful and even end up being dead, I want someone to run an autopsy on my brain because I feel that it's not okay, and he even gives a check for $30,000 for this autopsy to be done. So when they do the autopsy, they actually look inside and what they see is that he has a massive tumor pressing on the part of the brain called the amygdala that's right at the center that potentially could have led to this uh, aggression and, and fearful behavior that might have led that. But you don't have to go that far into crazy stories like this person who changes an entire behavior. You can all stick with yourself tonight at the reception that happens in a few hours when you take a limited molecule called ethanol and you pull it on your, your Mikisla glands and suddenly everything becomes nicer and everyone becomes a little more funny and everything is kind of different. So we all know this thing that, that our brain can actually change uh, unbeknownst to us. And now the question again, can I find this moment that your brain changes 
manipulate something there and have you just take, assume that this was always your choice and just live life thinking this everything happened was something that you wanted to do all the time. So we were looking for a specific uh, moment that we can actually uh, intervene and, and uh, send something to the brain. And what we saw is that there's actually a gap of a few seconds between the moment your brain makes a decision and the moment you know about them. So we had, for instance, this example where we had patients uh, play a game where they were trying to drive a car. And we tell them at some point the car is going to get to an intersection and you have to make a choice to go left or right. Whenever you get there, make a choice. But we look at their brain, we try to see how far before they made the choice can we already know that they're going to go right in a few seconds. Here's when they see the intersection and they actually make their choice. And we ask them not just when they made the choice, but also to tell us when they felt they actually had the idea of the choice and they tell us that it was somewhere here. So we see a couple of milliseconds gap between the moment I know what they're going to choose the, the brain commit to something, and the moment they actually feel that the choice was made. So this means that there's enough gap for us to come between and maybe change your memories, change your thoughts, and let life kind of course through, and you assume that it just was your decision. I'm going to show you in a second how we can do just that. Okay, so, uh, so far we just listened to the brain, and we found this gap. The question is if now we can actually come between and start changing things. So one thing to do is maybe change things in the world, and have your brain adapt to them. So what we did for that is we created a little experiment which we call the box. And it's a simple experiment told the patient, you're gonna sit in bed right now and you're gonna have in front of you a little wooden box. You can imagine how easy it was to pass this box from New York to Los Angeles uh, via TSA. But it's a different story. But when the box uh, sits there, you have two buttons, one on the left, one on the right. And we tell you in the next hour, we want you to just uh, press a button, either the one on the left or the one on the right, whenever you feel like it. All we care about is looking at how the brain looks when you make a choice, and we're gonna record the activity in your brain when you make the decision. So when you press the buttons, we're gonna turn the light on for three seconds. This tells you that we're now saving that up in your brain, so you have to do nothing when the uh, light's already on. When it turns off, you can start an hour trial. So for about one hour, you press the buttons a hundred times, and every now and then, when you press them, we tell you f f perfectly, we're saving data, and so on. This is what we tell the patient, but there's actually a trick in this experiment that we didn't tell the patient. The trick was that we didn't really care about their choice, which one they make, left or right, we cared about the timing of the choice. So what we did is we have a computer sit in the background, listen to the brain, and try to find cells that tell us a few seconds before you make a choice that you're about to make a choice. So I know here that in a few seconds here you're going to press a button. What we do then is we uh, try to do the following. We tell you not to touch anything with the lights already on, because we're saving data, but effectively what we do is we turn the lights on by ourselves before you press the button. So if you want to press the button, we turn the lights on, so every time you press the button, the light's already on. And then there's a big buzzer in the room, and we tell you, what did you do? We ask you not to press the button when the light's already on. I'm so sorry, doctor, it kind of happened by itself. Never mind, just destroy the experiment, but we're gonna start again. Sit there, whenever you see the lights turning on, just don't touch anything, and press it only when you're ready to press it. And here's kind of how it looks. So here's a person sitting in bed, so it's sitting in the room, and first she's just pressing button regularly, and at some point, the computer is gonna know that she's about to press, it's gonna wait for her just to get there, and then there's a buzzer that tells us that <laughs> Now this is a little manipulation that now changes your brain. So your brain tells me something, I act on that, and I do it against the other part of your brain that doesn't know that the choice was already made, and now I can actually stop manipulating the thing in the little space that I have between the moment your brain tells me the answer to the moment you know the answer that your brain told me. But the thing is, people are kind of uh, difficult because as soon as they uh, saw that we tried to manipulate them, they figured it out, they tried to do it faster, they tried to uh, trick us, they, they weren't as supportive of the idea of us changing their brain without, uh, without their consent. So we felt maybe there's a, a moment that they're so vulnerable and so open to changes that they don't even sit there to resist. And we figured out that there's probably a moment that your brain is really open to changes, happy to try new things, and is not uh, conscious enough to kind of stop and resist any change. And it turns out this is the moment when that happens uh, about a third of our life. Every day we have such a moment, we go to sleep. And the question is now, what stage of the sleep? So sleep is a maybe six to eight hours process that happens, but not all sleep stages are alike. There are moments in your sleep that you're just gonna wake up if I try to do something to you, but there's uh, specific windows, short windows, that if I do something, your brain is actually gonna receive the information, it's gonna change, and it's gonna introduce this new thought, this new memory into your life, such that it's, it's gonna think that it's actually yours, and if you're gonna wake up, you're gonna just live life as if it was something that was uh, generated from the inside. 
So basically, we'll uh, hack your brain while you're sleeping, we'll find a specific moment, and we'll try to change something in the world so that you wake up and have a decision that supposedly is yours, that was actually coming from us. So, uh, we tried all kinds of changes. I'm just gonna uh, list two today, but you can imagine now that if I can come in your sleep and make something happen, I can think of ways to stop bad behavior. I can tell me, you can tell me I wanna stop smoking, and maybe you can help me do that while you're sleeping because my conscious self is not, is not helpful. You can try to kind of help people communicate better by changing all kinds of biases that you have against people or for people in your brain. We can actually uh, try to make you more creative by eliminating all kinds of uh, thresholds that you have towards new ideas, and we can even try to think of different ways to uh, improve education or learning by uh, figuring out ways to take data that you already inserted into your brain when you're awake and just make your brain rehearse it again and again so you really remember it better and basically the ultimate thing is you're gonna go to sleep and you're gonna wake up knowing kung fu that's the point of what we're trying to do uh, okay so uh, here's an example of one thing that we did recently a group that uh, uh, i work with basically took uh, uh, one of the easiest things in sleep uh, that uh, penetrates sleep really well but doesn't wake you up is uh, smells Turns out smells, if you control the, the, the odor amount perfectly, you can actually insert a smell and odor into someone's nose while they're sleeping at a specific moment and they actually smell that. We know that something happens in their brain, but they don't really wake up. So, one of, so in this study, what we did is basically took people who were smokers and they all said we want to stop smoking, bring to the lab, we say, okay, go take a nap for about three hours in the, in the lab. Uh, half the people get the treatment, half don't. And what happens is that we, we do something to you and when you wake up in the morning, we ask you to go home and keep a diary of how many cigarettes did you smoke in the week after. So those people started with about 13 cigarettes a day. And what happens is that during the sleep, in a specific window in the sleep, and that's important because that's why if you do it any other time, it tends to be in slow wave sleep, in the, in, in, the, in the five minutes that you have every 90 minute cycle that goes slow wave sleep, you have to introduce basically the, the smell of cigarettes, making the brain think cigarettes, and immediately after we inject the smell of rotten eggs to kind of make the brain associate or pale now a bad feeling with uh, cigarettes, and when they wake up they have less desire to do that, and what you can see is that within uh, the days to follow, everyone dropped uh, in a half their desire to smoke. And it doesn't happen to the group that wasn't treated. So basically, here's this little thing. You make the brain not like something that it liked before. It saves it in this slow sleep because it's a moment where the brain kind of stores information and wake up, just not feeling the same about this behavior. In the same way, we can now uh, find all kinds of uh, thoughts in your brain, find kind of uh, things that you carry in your, in your head, and then use them to actually navigate your dreams. And maybe have you tell a different story about your life. If you think of someone who had a bad, bad, bad traumatic experience, and he wants to leave that, but somehow learn to change that, this is what you do in therapy. You kind of tell the story of a bad experience, but you try to change the framework of that. Now we can actually make you dream that in your sleep, but introduce positive smells or positive thought, positive content into this specific moment where your brain is receptive to information and change that. So uh, we piggyback on the work of Jack and Anne from Berkeley where they uh, basically have people first watch movies and they map uh, the back of the brain in the part that kind of tells us how the visuals of a movie look and then what they did is they people then watch new movies and just had this kind of passing process, machine learning process, look at the back of the brain, trying to decode what they're dreaming. We tried to do the same thing with a group in Japan that looks at uh, now uh, dreams. So we basically, in the morning, map your thoughts uh, of a specific things like the Simpson, the Eiffel Tower, your mom, your dad, or anything we can find cell by cell in the morning. We have you go take a nap, and during your sleep, we try to uh, either look at your uh, patterns and see what you're dreaming of, what kind of story we think you have in mind, but also inject smells or sounds into your dream, try to change your course of action so you wake up with a different thought or maybe different kind of uh, framework of the same idea. Okay, so, um, so those are all uh, uh, ways to kind of change the brain in a moment where your brain is uh, very uh, kind of susceptible to changes. But here we ignore one thing, which is the brain has something that it's really incredible at. And maybe we can actually use them. The brain is really good in things that, that it's doing by itself, and actually the help of a person might be really good. One of the things the brain is really good at is a pattern recognition. So if you look at the brain, uh, we think of it as like uh, my brain sees, my brain smells, but the reality is that our brain sits inside our head in a very dark place full of water, it doesn't really see the world. All it gets about the world is information from your eyes, from your ears, from your nose. It just gets information and all this information turns in the head into signal that looks like this, the same, like spikes, and then the brain processes those spikes. So in many ways, we try to see, can we uh, use your interest in changing 
Uh, and the fact that the brain is really good in like, looking at uh, infinite patterns and finding meaning to actually find meaning in things that you don't know anything about. And we try to look at the, one of the most uh, famous puzzles that the world has been looking at for a while, which is chess. So chess is a game that people have been studying for a while. AI kind of used it as a hallmark to show that uh, we're good at that. In fact, uh, you know, about 20 years ago now, uh, there was a famous game between Kasparov and Deep Blue, where uh, finally a computer uh, win with chess. And in fact, what happened in the last 20 years is that uh, chess became such a, even though it's still a human characteristic to play chess well, it's something that you can barely win. As in most times, if you play chess on a computer, uh, very likely the computer is going to beat you uh, just because you're not good at it. And we try to say, but the brain is really good in uh, not, so playing chess is a really hard task, but the brain is really good in finding meaning in, in, in patterns. This example I really like uh, because it allows me to uh, promote vegetarianism. It turns out that uh, uh, if you try to look at uh, uh, in the pipeline when uh, chicks are being born and uh, people who kind of breed them have to decide uh, which one to keep and which one to uh, shred, they only want to keep the female ones. So what they do is that it's very hard to know when a chick is born if it's male or female. So what they do is they actually press them and based on the sound that they squeak, you can actually know if it's a male or female. If it's a female, they keep her. If it's male, they just shred them. And if you don't like that, you should be a vegetarian. <laughs> but if you don't care about that, if you just know that it's very, very hard for a person who doesn't know anything to just press a little chick and know if it sounds like a man or a woman. So the training is go like, goes like that. The person sits there, pulls up a little chick, squeezes it, and decides says it's a female. And behind him sits an expert who just listens to the chick and just taps on his shoulder every time he makes a mistake. Turns out within two days, every person gets about 99.9% accuracy. They rarely make mistakes. Somehow, just by a machine learning version of human, they somehow learn perfectly how to listen to the difference in sounds between uh, male and female chicks. If that's the case, then we can maybe uh, take the fact that the brain is really good in seeing a meaning pattern and use that to train you with your help now to change things by absorbing information outside. So you've seen this pattern on the screen for a while now, and I bet that without even making any effort, you already know that there's a pattern here. You already know that there's two uh, uh, shapes that are red and one that is yellow. You already know how they, that they circulate uh, uh, clockwise. You already know uh, what's the speed that they base. So your brain, without any effort, somehow learn this pattern. In the same way, this is a study from the 1940s, uh, Franz Heiner and Marianne Simmel took people and showed them this movie. And what they saw is that without any effort, your brain immediately starts making up a story from just this little picture of shapes moving around. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip that one, but you probably will start seeing a bad person, a good person, and there's a couple here, and maybe the female is the circle, and the male is the triangle, and they're fighting, and you kind of, your brain, without any effort, start finding some kind of a story in this meaningless pattern of movement. Uh, in the same way, your brain is really good in detecting changes, and your brain has all kinds of machinery in it that's really good in finding things that stand out. For example, I'm going to show you now a picture, and I ask you to pay attention to, there's going to be a grid of pictures. And there's going to be one thing that stands out. Try to see how much time it takes your brain to find the thing that stands out. Ready? Three, two, one. Very fast, right? Without it making any effort, your eyes just moved to the face and you kind of saw that without trying to find pattern. In the same way, I'm going to show you another example. Try to see how long it takes you in the next one. Three, two, one. Much slower now. Because our brain doesn't come with a, a church detection mechanism. There's a church here in the among many, many cars. So somehow our brain is really good at detecting patterns and it just helped you right now solve a puzzle that you uh, didn't know existed. And we said, okay, let's try to see if we can harness all of that with the element of our subjects and solve puzzles that are really, really hard. And now I'm gonna combine the two puzzles I mentioned from before. So what the subjects do, they got to the level, they basically said, they're, they're told, here's a, a little picture you see on the screen. You see this picture and you hear a sound. And we ask you to make a choice. What is the score of this picture on a scale of minus 10 to 10? You can make a guess right now in your head, and the person might say, this one is a 9. You say, congratulations, this was a 9, and you actually got 10 points. Here's another pattern. Magnet 10. <laughs> what is that? You start guessing that now, and I tell you, this is actually a uh, minus one, and you get a negative three reward. People just play this game for a while, and they don't even know what they're playing, what, what's this game? They do it for a while, but we actually, what we actually did is we took a game of chess, 
We translate it into a, a pattern with sounds, and what they actually do is they learn to score boards of chess. Now, we try to take most people who didn't play chess in their life, I don't know the rules of chess, but after that for a while, for hours, they start actually seeing meaning. They start saying, you know, this pattern is always a minus nine, this one is always a plus seven. They actually learn how to stop puzzle, just because their brain is really good in looking at patterns and finding meaning. And actually, they do much better Let's get this one. They actually do much better when they don't try to apply any context. We don't try to explain that they, it's, it's better when the black circle is above. They cannot try to do it better. We actually learn after a few trials that it's better if we change it and make the reward in money and change the sound to a little bit more harmonic sounds, something like that. No? So, we, so even when we made it to a game, we saw that people are, are uh, doing uh, not badly, but not really good. So after uh, maybe 10 hours of playing, you see the improvement is kind of marginal. People get out of hundreds of trials that they play, they get to you know, about a quarter of the trial that they do really well, 25 trials that do really well. Then we said, let's combine the fact that people want to do better, the fact that their brain is really good in seeing patterns in things that kind of look meaningless, and the fact that we can actually do things in your sleep and find a specific moment in your sleep where your brain is uh, responsive for information uh, and have you basically go to sleep in the lab and when you're sleeping we keep playing those sounds to you of the good boards and telling you it's a good one and the bad boards and telling you it's a bad one and suddenly people get much better so over uh, many many naps we bring people every couple of days for two hours of training and half an hour of a nap so they have a half a cycle we train them in their nap to keep listening to the sounds and now they get really really good in playing chess so here's the, the puzzle that I always wanted to to solve. A person basically didn't know chess learns to suddenly see meaning in very complex patterns. They do it even better when they don't try to understand what the meaning is, they're just trying to, trying to kind of do it unconsciously. And ultimately, they're, they're playing a game that uh, they're, about, they're, allowed, they're able to actually be the better in chess. Now, unfortunately, just when we ran the study and we started being very happy, a guy in Imperial College created a, a code, uh, in deep, deep learning code, uh, that uh, trained the computer to do the same thing, just introduce tons of like games into the computer and have the computer learn how to play chess and it took us uh, about 25 hours to get to a level of about you know 200 trials out of 500 and the computer basically gets uh, within 72 hours to beat us. So I felt that uh, this is kind of the end of the world but then I saw something that I really liked. I saw the famous movie of Watson playing against uh, the two uh, top players in Jeopardy and I'm going to show you a, a moment from the uh, third day of Jeopardy playing against Ken Jennings and I forget Brad, I forget his name but this is a moment that no one uh, pointed out to me until today and I felt it's the most interesting moment in the game so the computer, you probably all know it, the computer wins after a few rounds the computer becomes uh, uh, invincible but what you see here is the moment where Watson kind of takes over so this guy is basically behind next question is going to come up right now Ken Jennings, the human is still ahead, but he's tied almost with Watson. And the question is going to come up. Watson is going to pick the question. I want you to look at to the left at Ken Jennings and see how he responds to this to this problem. Uh, Nonfiction for two thousand, please. HBO's miniseries John Adams was based on this author's Pulitzer Prize-winning biography. Watson, who is Dable? He gets really upset. For eight hundred. And now he loses, this, of this loses the lead. And now comes the next question. What happens right now? Secretly to private conversations. He can. Presses the button. Yes. And he, he, he goes back to almost die. As for your question, rise or fall depending on a standard such as cost of living. Watson, what is S? Loses another trial. Yes. What Again, this was in the head. This plain weave sheer fabric made with tightly twisted yarn it happens. is also used to describe a pie or cake. Ken, what is... He presses the button. Chiffon. Chiffon. And then he thinks for a second and he knows the answer. So when he pressed the button, he didn't know the answer yet. He knew it, he knew it. So he is a, he's a bit behind, he feels like nervous that he's losing his, his, his edge, he's gonna lose in the end. But for the first time, it happens something very interesting, which is the question gets asked, he's so angry that he presses the button, and he says, eh, and then he answers it. So somewhere in his brain, he knew that he knows the answer, and he had to spend time retrieving it from the other part of the brain to kind of give information all the way. So this means that there's kind of a hope, which is in our brain, lives this person who can aggregate information, solve puzzles, and maybe we can, we can use this person to, to find the most interesting aspect of the puzzle, which is uh, the part that makes us unique. There's this quote that I really like uh, from Asimov, it says that the bishop is the most important piece on the chessboard, in the eyes of the bishop. No. <laughs> and, and, and in many ways, to me, this is the embodiment. We're going to lose chess over time. Players are getting even better than us. 
but there's still something human to the ability to kind of know that you know and you have enough time to do it. So this basically allows me to say, let's try to give humans the ability to fix the things that they are not good at with the help of computers. Here's an example. Here are athletes that we found in Red Bull in Los Angeles. And this guy is the world champion BMX rider. He comes to the lab and we ask this guy to cycle on a treadmill for uh, as long as he can. And we tell him uh, one requirement, we're gonna scan your brain while you cycle, we're gonna scan, we're gonna draw blood from you, we're gonna look at your heart rate, expression, everything. We ask you that while you cycle, you let us increase the, the power as much as we can, and you cannot stop until we tell you to stop. You guys, what do you mean? So you're just gonna continue until I tell you to. And the guy says, okay, it's gonna be 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you don't know, just continue. So the guy cycled, the cyclist, we actually never planned to stop him because we wanted to break. So what happens is at some point, he breaks and says, I cannot do it anymore. And then you can include his brain and see how the brain looks just before you break. You know, you start running the marathon. First, it's very, very easy. Your brain says, run. The leg says, no problem. After two, mi two miles, it says, hey, continue running. The leg says, no problem. And after a few miles, it becomes really, really hard. And the legs and the brain are kind of fighting until you somehow give up. That's the moment we care about. Because then we can actually bring it the day after and say, train again. The same thing, do the same thing you did before, but now we're going to give you feedback on the moment you're about to break. We're going to tell you that your brain is about to collapse, and we ask you to just stay a little longer at this specific moment. So get to the moment where you're about to break, it doesn't matter to me if it's about one after one mile or ten miles, whenever you're about to break, I'm going to know and I'm going to give you feedback about your brain about to collapse, and you try just stay one minute longer at this thing. And then we can actually do the most interesting thing, which is train your brain to become better, rather than your muscles. So we basically start training you over the brain. I like this picture that I showed you in the beginning, because it shows you that uh, our brain, as much as we try to train them, as much as, as much as we're trying to become better in training them, we still have a wall that makes it very, very hard for us to, to wall, because this is a gym in Los Angeles, and everyone came to exercise a gym, but the guys who built the gym actually put uh, stairs to go there, but also escalator, uh, making everyone who came to the gym feel that there is a little way to escape the, the efforts. And in many ways, this is the world uh, we we're living right now. It's a world that has a lot of things that go with our brain, a lot of obstacles that make our brain uh, really find it difficult to solve problems. So uh, in many ways, if you think about it, uh, we used to die a hundred years ago mostly from things that the world caused us, but right not now, we're mostly dying from things that we cause ourselves, things that come from flaws in our brain. Uh, we eat too much, we smoke, we drink and drive, we text and drive, all kinds of things that make us uh, uh, have a difficult life. And that's where I think uh, there's a business proposition. So I know the audience has a lot of entrepreneurs. So I found that it's important to not just tell you about the things we did already uh, that show you that you can actually change the brain with uh, uh, sleep or help or patterns that the brain kind of makes sense of by itself, but actually saying that I think that the ultimate uh, uh, solution to what the next step is when it comes to brain signals and brain processing and hacking it is combining the harnessing the, the power of computers and helping the brain do better while using this moment of gap that Ken Jennings have, when you know the answer but you don't know what it is, and having Watson help you. And in many ways, there's a, there's a, a, a nice example that I hear often about chess, uh, from, uh, you heard it from Joey and from Barak yesterday, that says that uh, turns out that computers pretty much beat anyone in the audience in chess, but there's still one entity that beats a computer in chess, and it's a team of humans and computers together. And in many ways, I think that the next step towards a, a world where we humans are going to have a better uh, use and going to benefit from that is creating all kinds of applications that try to take the good things computer can have and combine them with, with, with what humans choice. So for instance, instead of uh, you controlling your own schedule, have a computer decide what your schedule is and you just have to approve that. Have a computer answer your emails and you just have to say yes. Try to use the fact that computers are really good in kind of uh, doing things that involve big data and humans to make the final decision. And that's, I think, uh, where I'm going to end that, because I think that we're at a stage where uh, we're uh, approaching understanding uh, the universe uh, in a way that was very uh, strange to people who lived 400 years ago. They thought that the Earth is center and everything evolved around the Earth. And 400 years ago, they realized effectively that actually it's not the case, but in fact, the Earth is just another star and the Sun is the center. And when Galileo Galilei discovered that, and he had to adjust all these equations, he was troubled by the fact that suddenly the Earth is in the center, because it changed the entire world view. In the same way, we're now understanding that uh, in our world, in our brain, we're not the own, only people there, we're not the center of our own universe. Even in our own head, there's many uh, people living there, and we can talk to one in, in regards, uh, regarding, disregarding the other. But I think our understanding that the brain has more characters and we can actually manipulate one or the other and make for better us is in many ways the next step to what we can do because we're going to discover the most interesting thing in the universe, which is us.
Thank you.